It's another edition of Guest of the Week, the program that brings to you issues, bring to you personalities where we profile them, we profile issues, we analyze them, profile solutions to them. Today on the program Guest of the Week, we have a guest already seated in the studio. The federal government has declared Monday public holiday to celebrate the birth of one of the greatest human beings to ever live. Talking about Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessing of God be upon him. Of course, I'm sure you might be familiar with the migration from Mecca to Medina. You might be a little bit familiar about the birth of the Prophet. You might be familiar with the story of an orphan who became one of the most celebrated scholars, one of the best lawyers, one of the best historians. I mean, we can go on and on. The name remains Abdul Aziz Ahmed Kader. Welcome you to another edition of the program. Our guest today is uh, an Islamic scholar. He is so many things rolled into one. But today, I'm sure we shall be talking Idul uh, Maulud or Maulud al Nabi, that is the birth of Prophet Muhammad. Our guest today is Sheikh Haliru Maraya. Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa Thank you for having you here with us. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, yeah. let's start from Maulud. When we say Maulud, what yeah. do we mean by Maulud? A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen wa alihi tayyibin al-tahirin wa sahbihi jami'an haqqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-azim. Uh, going by your question, the word Mawlid uh, is an Arabic word. Okay. Uh, linguistically, it refers to two things. Firstly, it refers to any place of birth. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, somebody who was born here in Kaduna, then on the basis of the Arabic language, you could say that their Mawlid is Kaduna. Okay. Uh, that means he was born in Kaduna, place of birth. That is one of the two linguistic meanings okay. of the word Mawlid. Then the second linguistic meaning of the word Mawlid refers to a period of birth. Uh, so and so, for instance, was born in the month of January. Then, Arabically, uh, their Mawlid was January when they, were, when they born. were born. So, whenever the month of January comes, that means the period, the month, uh, where that particular individual was born has arrived. Right, okay. But now, jurisprudentially, when you talk of Mawlid, it refers to the celebration that the Muslims always embark upon, particularly in the month of Rabiul Awal, with a view to commemorating the noblest birth on this planet. In other words, the birth of the greatest messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, Muhammad. In a nutshell, Mawlid refers to the commemoration of the birth the of the greatest messenger of Allah, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Well, people yeah. say sometimes Muslims are divided about yeah. the birth of Prophet Muhammad. When he was given to the actual date, uh, why do we have this uh, differentiation sometimes, or disagreement amongst some Islamic uh, 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 brethren. Brethren. Yeah, because the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as uh, it affects the period. Hmm. Uh, it was derived not from the Holy Quran, okay. not also from the Hadith of okay. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In other words, the Quran does not say that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born on so 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 period. Okay, okay. No, the hadith. Okay. In other words, the Prophet himself did not say that I was born on the twelfth day of Rabil Awal, or I was born in the month of Rabil Awal, or I was born in the month of Rajal. You understand? The period of the birth of 
Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is something that centers on history. Okay. So that is why there is no consensus among Islamic scholars uh, in, uh, in the case of the period of the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But even in relation to the period of the noblest birth, when you talk of the day, the very day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <coughs> was born, you will quite agree with me that there is a consensus okay. among Islamic scholars that he was born on a Monday. Okay. Okay. Because there was a hadith yeah. that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he was born on a Monday because he was fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. Okay. His companions asked him, why do you fast on Mondays? He said, I was given a revelation on that very day okay. and I, will, I was also born on it. That is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was fasting on Mondays. In other words, he was commemorating his birth on a weekly basis. Well, that brings us again <laughs> yeah. to another controversial issue. Because sometimes when people celebrate their birthdays, people will tell you, well, it's, it tell you that this <coughs> is not Islamic. But someone will say, if the Prophet could actually fast, fast on Mondays, that could be a way of also celebrating one birth. Yeah. Uh, Brother Abdulaziz, anyone who says that the celebration of any birthday uh, is a prohibition in the religion of Islam mm -hmm. has erred. Okay. Because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, have the the, 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 the right and power okay. to prohibit whatever they want to prohibit. Mm -hmm. For instance, if one says celebration of birthdays is a prohibition in Islam, then he has to tell uh, the general public who has prohibited it. If it was prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then let him quote the Quranic verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the celebration of any birthday is a prohibition in the religion of Islam. And if it was prohibited by Muhammad, peace be upon him, then the individual must uh, supply a hadith. That is a saying of the Prophet. You understand where Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the celebration of birthdays is a prohibition in Islam. Prohibiting anything in the religion of Islam uh, does not fall within the purview of anybody but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, we talk about Mulud. Now, the birth of the Prophet, it's one that people, I mean, make reference to almost on daily basis. Yeah. Lessons, a lot of lessons to learn from uh, him. This was a man who was born, not know how to read and write. Then the first revelation came telling him to read. To read. And by the time he died, up to today, even people who are not Muslim, <laughs> who are not Muslims, yeah. will study him and say he remains one of the greatest human beings that ever lived. Mm. Let's look at the life of the Prophet. Salam His birth, Salam. for instance. Yeah. Let's look at the birth of the Prophet in Mecca. What are the lessons to learn from his birth in that place? Who, at a point, he had to migrate out of? Yeah. Uh, there are numerous lessons. Okay. A relation to the birth of the greatest messenger of Allah Muhammad peace be upon him. One you can deduce from the venue of his birth, that means the place of his birth, Mecca. Uh, at, as at the time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in the city of Mecca, uh, the city was in a serious mess all sorts of criminal activities were being committed in that very city okay. because at that material time uh, there wasn't any message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a view to prohibiting the commission of any criminal activity okay. in that very city so it was a city that was very chaotic it was a city that was in a very serious disorder. Lawlessness. Lawlessness mm. was the order of the day at that material time. 
but the most pious human being was born in that very city. Today, as we are talking in this very studio, nobody can commit any criminal activity, evidently, in that very city. Whatever you want to commit must be committed in hiding. That means the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sanctified the city of Mecca. Due to his birth, the Holy Quran was revealed in that very city. If the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were to be born in another city, definitely that city would have been the place where part of the Holy Quran would have been revealed. Okay. In a nutshell, what I want to deduce as a lesson from the numerous lessons concerning the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the city of Mecca is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has brought honor to the city. To the city. What shake again? <laughs> the, the, I mean, let's look at a verse that is talking about verse of the Holy Quran. Yeah. That talked about a dead thing can come out of a living thing. Yeah. And a living thing can come out <laughs> yeah. of a dead thing. Yeah, in Al Imran. Yeah, in Surah Al Imran. Yeah. I asked that question because today we we are in a situation where some people feel that they are the pious. Yeah. And the other people are not <laughs> pious. And they, they they degrade them, look at them or what have you, thinking nothing good could come out of that. Yeah. Uh the most pious in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because piety is something that is always been uh, planted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart of an individual. Okay. Therefore, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether one is pious or otherwise. Therefore, for one to come out apparently to say, uh, more pious than so and so. Yeah, nothing good will come. Out <laughs> of you. Nothing good will come out of you. Yeah. Uh, such uh, is a taboo in the religion of Islam. Okay. It is a gross violation of the injunction of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, mm. where He says, "Allahu Do not purify yourself. Yes, Do not say that you are more righteous than so and so. So the proclamation by an individual that he or she is better than so and so in terms of piety is not consistent with the injunction, tenet, and teaching of the religion of Islam. And from the birth of the Prophet that we saw in yeah. the Mecca that was chaotic, yeah. lawlessness. A very chaotic city, a very uh, disorderly city produced the most pious human Jumabe. being in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That very city produced the leader of the entire messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That city produced the very individual who received the best revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via the Archangel Gabriel. This clearly showcases that uh, cities don't matter. What matters are the individuals that could be produced in that very city. And no matter how chaotic a particular city is, a man who can be an epitome of piety could be produced by that particular city. What the lesson uh, teaches us in relation to what you have mentioned is that people, regardless of where they have found themselves, must do all that they can to ensure that they adhere strictly to the injunction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their ethnicity, their tribal leaning, their national leaning, their continental leaning, the city where they have been uh, born and bred, uh, all the aforementioned don't matter. What matters in the sight of Allah is your relationship with Him. Okay, well, talking about one's relationship with God, now, I mean, there is a popular saying in Al that there is no there is no orphan except a coward. 
Also, as an addendum to what we have discussed yes. uh, just now, yeah. uh, prior to the birth of Muhammad, peace be upon him, there were about 360 idols. I was actually going there. In the Holy Kaaba. Yeah. But today, in the entire city of Mecca, there is no single idol. Now the Kaaba becomes the holiest place today. The Kaaba the of the earth. is the holiest uh, place uh, one can think of. Arguably, on this planet, mm. it is the dream of any believer uh, to have found themselves in that particular place, mm. and uh, this is attributable to also the emergence and also the uh, the availability at a particular time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in that very city. Okay. Yeah. Well, Sheikh, the issue is being an offer, people yeah. see it as, as, as being disadvantaged. But here we are talking about a man who was often at a very tender age. But a man who became the most soft after, the man who became the most successful yeah. businessman, become the best of husbands, become the best of virtually the best everything, of everything we can talk about. Yeah. What lesson is there for us to learn? Because this is when we see an orphan or somebody is orphan, he sees it as a burden. He becomes a burden on his society. Uh, I thank you, Iman Slee, for mentioning this. Mm. Uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa uh, truly lost his father when he was just two months in the womb of his the blessed mother. mother. Mm. Aminami, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued to be pleased with her. Uh, then he lost his mother at the age of six. In other words, he became a complete orphan at the age of six. He had no father, no mother at the age of six. But in terms of behavior, in terms of the revelation of excellent human qualities, he had nobody to be equated with mm -hmm. in the very city of Mecca at that material time. Mm -hmm. And even today, nobody can be equated with him in terms of behavior and the revelation of excellent human qualities. In terms of piety, generally, he has nobody who happens to be on the same pedestal with him. Mm -hmm. Why? because he was being taken care of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did all that he could to live his life, even before he received the first revelation, in accordance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved and cherished at that material time. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had no words of himself, had no actions of himself during his lifetime. His words and actions were all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the lesson we can deduce uh, from that is that uh, being an orphan is not a minus. Okay. What is a minus is being a delinquent in a particular society. Okay. An orphan who is righteous is not an orphan apparently because he has allowed good conduct and the revelation of excellent human qualities to be his watchdog. He always do all that he can to live his life in accordance with the norms and also in accordance with the regulations of a very, very uh, uh, normal society. In other words, or conversely, somebody who happens uh, not to be an orphan. His two parents are alive, but he has gone astray. He's a delinquent in a particular society, or he always displays a high degree of uh, youthful exuberance. Uh, such a person in the actual sense is the orphan. Uh, this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the creator of wisdom, been uh, oft wise, made Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to be very, very righteous and at the same time an orphan. Had he lived 
with his two parents. Some people might have thought that he was really uh, being guided at all times by his parents. But he lived his life without both parents of his. In spite of that, nothing affected him in terms of being a very righteous individual then and now. Mm. Well, uh, we will we'll, we'll go to how to celebrate uh, Lut, but yeah. we all know that all across the world, uh, people celebrate this Mawlut. Yeah. Uh, this month, the Islamic uh, uh, month is declared as the month that the Prophet was giving birth to, even though nobody can say precisely which of the uh, day of the month. But then, how should one celebrate the birth of the Prophet? Uh, the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could be ce celebrated by doing anything one uh, knows it is considered righteous okay. by the religion of Islam. Okay. For instance, Quranic recitation. recitation. Okay. One can earmark a certain portion of their time on that very day to be reciting the Holy Quran with a view to commemorating the birth mm of the greatest messenger of Allah, paying visit to hospitals okay. with a view to seeing how patients are doing in that particular hospital and if they have their wheel also to extend uh, a helping hand, okay. you understand, to the patients. Paying visitations to our correctional centers, that is the prisons, Prison. with a view to preaching to the uh, inmates yes and telling them that they should emulate the very individual that was born uh, in this very month, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because Brother Ablaziz, you quite agree with me that the over 70,000 inmates uh, who are currently serving various jail terms in our correctional centers today uh, majorly are youths. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a young man, he was the best young man in his community. So by visiting the prisons, people can be telling the inmates that when you come out after you have regained your freedom, emulate the greatest messenger of Allah. By being people, by being young people who will be contributing positively to the development of your various communities. Also, paying visitations to one's relations or even placing calls on one's relations, friends, and anyone one can think of to tell them that I have decided to give you a call today in order to show my happiness in relation to the birth of the greatest messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Feeding the needies, visiting orphanages, taking material things to our orphanages with a view to telling them that we have decided to visit you today in order to celebrate with you the noblest birth on this planet that is the birth of the greatest messenger of Allah even for instance uh, if someone owes you certain amount of money you can tell them or you can even visit them or you can give them a call that today as you know uh, in accordance with the opinions of the majority of Islamic scholars uh, is the very day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. Mm. Hence, in order to show my happiness to this greatest bounty Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has endowed upon us, I have decided to reduce the debt. Yeah, okay. You understand uh, that uh, you are owing me. Uh, you know, you owe me 10,000 naira, but due to the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now consider it that you only owe me 5,000 naira. Uh, in a nutshell, a revelation of excellent human qualities. Yeah. Also, organizing lectures with a view to educating the general public on the qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Maybe one can be given a topic to discuss how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, conducted his life as a businessman. Okay. 
uh, how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mm -hmm. conducted his life as a marital person, as a family person. Okay. How the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam conducted himself as a leader. Even the leaders, the governors, the president, members of the Senate, members of the House of Reps, chairman of our various local government councils, you understand, could be invited to hear how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam executed leadership. Okay. Well, let's take a, a quick break. Is the half-line mark of the program, guest of the week. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be looking at other aspects of the birth of the Prophet, his time, his death, and the great lessons for us to learn. Don't go away. We will be right back. Thank you for being there. If you just joining us, the program is Guest of the Week, and we are looking at Idil Maulud, that is, uh, or Maulud Nabi, whichever you want to call it, the birth of the Prophet of Islam, the Prophet of God, the Prophet who is actually sent to all humankind, the Prophet who today, even non-Muslim who have actually studied his life, will tell you that he remains the greatest human being to ever live. In terms of leadership, in terms of adjudication, in terms of business, in terms of uh, even uh, matrimony, talking about Prophet Muhammad, may the peace of uh, peace and blessing of God be upon him. Amen. And we have with us our, as our guest today an Islamic scholar, Sheikh Halilu Baraya. Well, Sheikh, the Prophet is known as Al Amin. Al Amin. I mean, that is one name that whoever knows the meaning will no. actually. Be identified with. No. I mean, what is the meaning of Allah mean and how did it come about that day? Yeah, you see, as I said earlier, mm. uh, throughout his stay in the city of Mecca prior to that noble migration to the city of Medina, mm. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam exhibited sublime human qualities. Okay, he was very sincere and also very trustworthy. So now coming to your question, the meaning of Al-Amin simply means the trust trustworthy. The Meccans were entrusting their belongings to him. Okay. And there was never a time he was found wanting. Even on the very night he was to migrate to the city of Mecca, okay. Okay. after he, uh, on uh, he, the very night he was to migrate to the city of Medina, Medina. Yeah. after receiving permission to do so from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he invited our leader, uh, his companion, one of his companions, and also uh, his cousin, mm -hmm. Sayyidina Ali Karamallahu Wajahu, and gave him all the belongings of the Meccan people that were with him okay. with a view to delivering such to the, the real owners. owners. Okay. They were intending to assassinate him. They were intending to kill him. They were exhibiting all sorts of persecution against him and his companions. But on the very night he was to leave that very city, the first thing he did was to make sure that the property, all the belongings of the Meccan people were safeguarded okay. and were also taken to the real oh, owners. Okay. So simply, he was very trustworthy. Uh, no trustworthy person on this planet could be equated with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in terms of trustworthiness. Uh, this is uh, very important. The lesson we can deduce from that is that if you love, if you love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then make concerted effort to be trustworthy. to be trustworthy. Trustworthy in office, trustworthy at home, trustworthy wherever you have found yourself. Uh, another issue is, this: we're talking about a prophet who you ca we can say lived the whole of his, his, his lifetime as a youth. 
because the prophet yeah. lived at an age that today you can say, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that we still see as, yeah. as a youth. But again, we are in a situation today where the youth talk about getting the right education, not getting an employment, not getting a job to do. What lessons are there to learn from the life of the prophet? Yeah. You see, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the greatest knowledgeable and educated individual that was produced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as you have rightly been pointed, when he was a young person in the very city of Mecca, he didn't wait for the then authorities of that ancient city to okay. provide any job opportunity for him. He decided to be a shepherd. He was shepherding animals for the people of Mecca mm. with a view to sustaining his life. Right. Okay. This is a lesson that could be deduced from the young people of today that no matter how educated you are, you are not expected to rely on government alone in relation to job creation. Create the jobs for yourself. Be a mechanic. Be a uh, uh, be also a shepherd, be a mason, be a tailor, be a carpenter. There are a lot of medium skills that one can embrace with a view to sustaining uh, or with a view to earning a living. That was what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam exhibited by being a shepherd. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala would have provided Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam with everything that he wanted or needed in order to live a life, but because he was sent to teach us lessons of life, as a young person, he was a shepherd, and also there was a time he was employed by one of the richest ladies of the city of Mecca at that material time, okay. Khadija, who subsequently became his wife. He became her employee. One can say that he served under the uh, under uh, he served for the private sector. Two things now with regard to unemployment that is currently bedeviling our youth. Mm -hmm. That means the first thing as a young person who loves Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in terms of job creation emulate him. Okay. No matter how. Uh, uh, lowly you think a particular job is embrace it because Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a shepherd he didn't consider it as a menial job he did it to earn a living he served under a lady a woman he didn't say oh I'm a man I won't serve a lady he served her he was managing her businesses entirely because of the trustworthiness and sincerity she saw in him she approached him for a marriage and subsequently they became a couple this clearly showcases that our young people should not be idle they should not be idle they should do all that they can to embrace anything that is lawful in order to earn a living. Otherwise, they will not be contributing positively to the, to the development of their communities uh, in particular and the country at large. Well, uh, Sheikh, that brings us to the issue of leadership. Because today, I mean, even people who are not Nigerians will tell you that a major problem in Nigeria is leadership. Mm. Nigeria is blessed with human resources. Nigeria is blessed with natural resources. I mean, everything we, we, we can actually think of. But people will say our problem is leadership. Yet we have people at the helm of affairs who profess the, the, the religion of Islam, who ordinarily, by just be studying the uh, life and time, the leadership quality, the leadership style of the prophet, so will have been outstanding. Yeah. Why are we having this problem? <coughs> the, Why are these people not yeah. actually? <coughs> the problem is that uh, the preponderance of Muslims 
just proclaim the religion without okay. putting its injunctions into practice. practice. Okay. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was a very just leader. He was a leader who provided for the lead whatever they wanted, particularly the basic necessities of life. I know definitely our viewers know that there was a time, many times even, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam provided portable drinking water for his people through his fingers. Okay. He went to that end to provide water for his people. He provided food for his people. He provided security for his people. There was a time in the city of Medina, a very strange sound was heard. People were running helter-skelter in the night. So the, the brave ones among them came out and decided to go towards the direction of the sound. Okay. On their way to the destination, they met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam coming okay. back on a horse telling them that you should all go back and uh, nothing will happen. This clearly showcases that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took security mm. as primary, as something that was supposed to be done at all times by the leadership. Mm. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated all and sundry with justice and equity. Even the non-Muslims at that material time, they never for a day said that they had been subjected to any form of injustice. Despite the fact that he was persecuted by the non-Muslim idolaters in the city of Mecca. But when he migrated and established the Islamic community in that very city of Medina, he neither persecuted nor subjected any non-Muslim to any form of injustice. What can, we do, what can our leaders deduce from that? Is that whether people have voted for you or, or they have not voted for you, immediately after election you should embrace all and sundry as yours. Treat them equally. In terms of infrastructural development, ensure that justice and equity are exhibited by you. Do not allow any sentiment to carry you, you away from being a just leader. What, like you said, one quality that stands the prophet out is embracing all, yeah. all and sundry. To the extent that we saw people who, before, even make a tent on his life or even plan to kill him, yeah. embracing the religion. The religion. Of Islam. But today we are in a situation where we even have adherents of Islam driving away people from the religion by their <laughs> acts. Should it be like that? It shouldn't be. Hmm. It shouldn't be. That is why one of the things to be done to celebrate or to commemorate the birth of the Prophets. greatest messenger of Allah is to be organizing lectures okay. with a view to enlightening and educating the general public on how the greatest messenger lived his life. That will go a long way in reforming our people and societies. Okay. For instance, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always repelling bad with good. Whatsoever evil uh, done to him. Yeah. Any evil that was perpetrated against him would be repelled by the revelation of excellent human qualities from the Prophet. That means people who did bad against him, he will reward them with good. For instance, the issue you mentioned, there are, there are many cases where the non-Muslims wanted to kill him. And in some cases, they were arrested and brought before him. But the only thing he told them was that you wanted to kill me whenever you intended to kill me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not permit that. 
go i have forgiven you it's just like today a governor of a particular state or a chairman of a particular local government or a president of a particular country mm. people will plan to assassinate him and very uh, fortunately for him they were arrested and brought before him then he said okay you have intended to kill me but, but i know that you did not succeed and whenever you intend to do so again you will not succeed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to protect me go i have forgiven you brother abdul aziz once they leave that place definitely they will become the good friends of that particular leader sometimes leaders uh, seem to always add enemies to themselves mm. what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did was the act of reducing enemies, enemies. through the revelation of excellent human qualities such as forgiveness such as pain bad or good okay such as extending a helping hand to even enemies mm -hmm. treating both friends and enemies with justice treating people who were close to him and those who are not close to him with justice and equity mm -hmm. what well, actually another issue is when, we, when you talk about equity and justice in studying the life of the prophet we were meant to understand there were times that the prophet have to go to bed hungry just for the needy to have something to eat yeah. there are times that the prophet will even deny his household certain things so that an outsiders will even benefit yeah but here we are today we have leaders who will take and take and take and keep taking who while the people they lead go to bed hungry drive on bad roads i mean what are the lessons for, for leaders to learn from the life of, pro, of the prophet? Yeah, in relation to what you have said, mm. uh, uh, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam exhibited as a leader that the primary responsibility of leadership is security of lives and property. Okay. And you cannot secure the lives of people satisfactorily without without making sure that food security is achieved. Okay. Tell the people of Mecca to worship the Lord of this house. The Lord who has provided them with <coughs> bountiful food thus removed them from hunger then it was after allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned food security then wa amana min kauf and he brought peace to them thus removed them from fear so you do the the gov yeah, the there first is no food thing, security yeah, for you the to talk first about thing, security of a responsible property. leadership hmm. is expected to do is to ensure the availability within its jurisdiction of food security. Food security. Because hungry people can do anything you can think of in terms of criminal offenses yeah. in terms of the commission of criminal activities somebody said the stolen doesn't <laughs> have a conscience yeah definitely <laughs> definitely it must actually feel like that that was why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was always making sure that his companions were well fed before himself himself there was a time brother Abdullah, it took the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mm -hmm. two months without anything being cooked in his house in his house He was a selfless leader. Today, the so-called developed countries, despite the fact that 
their leaders are non-Muslims. Mm. Some of them don't even believe in the existence of the Almighty God. God. Yeah. But they have borrowed many things from what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did during his lifetime. Consequently, today they are leading the world. Because of those examples? Because of those examples. Okay. Just a few days ago, I came across a video. The Danish president, the president of Denmark, mm. receiving the French president on a bicycle. Mm. Just a few days ago. And they were plying the road on their bikes. And uh, common people were also plying it's the road. Right. This, uh, you understand the mm. same road on their bikes. Because of what? Unlike because of the exhibition of justice. Of justice. Unlike where we see now leaders in Sarin, <laughs> I mean, pushing you out of the road. In <laughs> many of these countries, as you know, hmm. and our viewers also know, leaders are not being fed with government yes. resources. You have your own salary. The salary is meant for you to cater for yourself and your immediate family members. That has really assisted such authorities to save resources in order to provide infrastructural development for the land. Many countries today don't have uh, what we call presidential fleet. Okay. Hmm. For instance, the UK. The UK. The, uh, the, 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 the leadership in, in the UK today, the for instance, the Prime Minister and the Queen, neither of the two has <laughs> a Prime Queen jet. jet. You yeah, understand yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Wherever the Queen will go, a ticket will be purchased for her on the British Airways. British Air. hmm. Also the Prime Minister. The German Chancellor has no private jet, okay. has no private aircraft. They are all doing that in order to save resources with a view to providing social amenities for the government. That is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Well, again, Sheikh, that, that, that brings us to this issue because we saw the, the, the migration of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina. To Medina. Uh, again, we see despite persecution, because we have a situation today that leaders persecute even those who criticize yeah. them. Yeah. What are the lessons for us to learn? When people persecute you, you have to bear it, but sometimes you have to move out to ensure that your freedom is ensured. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's safeguarded. Yeah, you see, in most of the sub-Saharan African countries of today, mm. uh, we say that we practice democracy, but in my opinion, we only practice civil rule. Okay. It is a cardinal principle mm. in a democratic setting for one to be allowed to express themselves. Okay. Provided what they are going to say will not be injurious to the dignity of anyone. anyone. People should be allowed to speak truth to power. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tolerated that. Many a times his companions challenged his decision. But he would, he, there yeah, was he never a time he took front. offense. Yeah. Mm. There was never a time he took offense that he was challenged. What he will do whenever he was challenged was to explain. Then after the explanation, the person in question will nod their head that they have really comprehended and accepted the verdict of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in relation to the issue in question. Therefore, I would like to use this opportunity to call on our leaders to always tolerate and allow people to criticize them. 
if the critic has criticized them positively, their tolerance and the criticism have now jointly helped the leader. Okay. And if the criticism was negative and the leader was able to tolerate the critic, he has now taught the entire government to be very, very tolerant of one another. Okay. When we talk like this, we know, I mean, the place of woman, uh, this money was saying, it is the same Islam who said uh, uh, the, the paradise of everybody lies beneath his mom. Yeah. Uh, again, when we talk about women, it's like sometimes people really get women to the background. Today, as we speak, the greatest authority on the sayings and practice of the Prophet is also a woman. It's also a woman. Where is the lesson for us to learn in terms of how to treat women? Uh, the position of women in Islam is something that is apparent. Okay. The smallest unit of leadership, mm. as far as Islam is concerned, is the family setting. Family setting. Mm. And no woman or no lady is permitted by the religion of Islam to be a leader of a particular family. She is always expected to be a follower of the gentleman. Mm. Supporting me. Whether he is rich or poor, okay. whether uh, she is higher than he is in terms of social status, he remains the leader of the family. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Holy Quran that was revealed to him emphatically said that women, his wives, should remain at home. Because in the religion of Islam, men are always expected to provide, to provide. for the ladies. Okay. That is why you notice that during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even during a congregational prayer, women at that material time and even now, that material term we are expected to be at the rear. Okay. Islam cherishes the rights of all and sundry. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created men to be the leaders of any setting. But not without relegating women to the background. But not Even without the ideals. Uh, the ideals are apparent. apparent. Okay. Their dues are apparent. Treat them for the queens that they, they are, are expected to be loved and at the same time respected. For instance, if a woman says, I won't go to any company in order to, to, to serve as an employee or I won't go to any government agency in order to serve as an employee, that has not uh, contradicted the position of Islam. Okay. Because the essence of going to the office is to earn a living. But anything she wants, anything she wants, it is the responsibility of the, the husband, husband to provide for her. For her. Islam has made that <laughs> yes. Sheikh, let's leave it on that note. Our time is fast spent. On that note, we end the program today. Guest of the week, it's actually Mawlud Nabi, celebration of the birth of the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad. May the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. Our guest today has been an Islamic scholar, Sheikh Ibrahim, Sheikh Haliru Faraya. Sheikh, thank you very much. For you are most time. welcome, Brother Blaziz. I equally thank you for oh, having me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Let's do it again next week when we shall be bringing you another guest. I am Abdul Aziz Ahmed Kader from the stables of Liberty Television, Voice for All and Vision for All. Have a nice day ahead.